Coming up on Arirang News. Marking the upcoming National Liberation Day, President Yoon grants special pardons to a little over 1,200 people, including key politicians, and reinstates the civil rights of liberal politician, former Gyeongsangnam-do governor Kim Kyung-suk. The ongoing heat wave is gripping South Korea as a whole. The country is seeing a surge in power demand, a significant number of heat-related illnesses, and damage to livestock. Vice President Kamala Harris holds a narrow lead over former President Trump, according to a national polling average, showing notable improvements from Biden's numbers. Thank you for joining Arirang News. I'm Kim bo -kyung. We start with the President's Liberation Day pardons, which included more than 1,200 people. As expected, President Yoon today made it possible for Kim kyung soo a key figure in the opposition, to get back into politics. Our correspondent Kim do -yeon explains its significance. In light of the upcoming National Liberation Day, President Yoon sung yeol has paved the way for the return to politics for a key opposition figure, restoring the rights of Kim kyung soo a former Gyeongsangnam-do province governor who was convicted of manipulating a number of online comment sections to help former President Moon Jae-in's election win in 2017. On Tuesday, the Justice Ministry announced that a total of 55 politicians have been included in the customary National Liberation Day pardon and clemency list. In particular, by granting pardons to those involved in public opinion manipulation, regardless of political affiliation, we aim to resolve the resulting political conflicts and create an opportunity to move forward in unity for the sake of national interest. Kim was pardoned back in December 2022, which only got him out of jail early, but he was prohibited from running for public office until December 2027. Kim is considered a key figure in the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea, and with this, he's now able to run for public office. In 2026, is the nationwide local elections, and in 2027, there is the next presidential election. And other politicians among the pardon included Cho yun Sun, a former culture minister under former President Park geun who was convicted for creating a blacklist of cultural figures. Meanwhile, in terms of the total list, President Yoon pardoned 1,219 people. More than 410,000 were also relieved of administrative penalties. Many of these were returning driving privileges to people who need to drive for their jobs. This pardon was primarily focused on revitalizing the struggling economy for ordinary citizens amid concerns about a global economic downturn and on creating an opportunity for national unity and harmony. In the meantime, the Justice Ministry says that 20 of the pardons made were for financial crimes business owners convicted due to being unable to pay off their debt. However, the ministry emphasizes there were no pardons for non-face-to-face -face online frauds targeting a large, unspecified number of people. Kim do Arirang News. The cabinet also proposed that President Yoon decline two opposition-led bills that the National Assembly recently approved, despite strong objections from the ruling party. One bill would provide a one-time economic relief payment in the form of vouchers worth around 250,000 Korean won, or roughly around 180 U.S. dollars to each South Korean. The other is a pro-labor bill that limits companies' claims for damages against striking workers. Prime Minister Han dok -soo called these legislative actions regrettable, saying they could burden the economy and the nation's fiscal health. The president can decide whether to reject the proposed legislation by August 20th. Once rejected, the bills will return to the National Assembly for a revote. President Yoon on Tuesday declared new special disaster zones following severe damage caused by heavy rain. The regions include four townships in Paju City, Gyeonggi-do Province, and Dangjin City in Chungcheong-Namdo Province. 
This comes after the government designated 11 regions as special disaster zones in mid-July. You noted that despite the monsoon season having ended late last month, residents of affected regions are still suffering from the fallout. He called on the Ministry of Interior and Safety and other cabinet members to swiftly carry out restoration projects and ensure disaster relief funds and other support measures are effectively delivered. The president also raised the need for thorough preparation as weather authorities predict there could be more rainfall than usual this year. The country is experiencing record high electricity demand due to the ongoing heat wave. The sweltering weather this summer has led to a rise in heat-related illnesses and has caused significant damage to livestock and the fisheries sector. Yuni brings us the details. South Korea's electricity demand hit a record high on Monday, with more people switching on their air conditioning units due to the intense summer heat. Data from the Korea Power Exchange on Tuesday reveals that peak power demand reached around 102.3 gigawatts between 2 to 3 p.m. on Monday, surpassing the previous record of 100.5 gigawatts set last August. Such a surge in demand comes as South Korea is experiencing sweltering temperatures. The country's meteorological center reported a high of around 34 degrees Celsius in Seoul on Monday. Additionally, Seoul has experienced a 23-day streak of tropical nights with minimum temperatures of at least 25 degrees. The total number of heat-related illnesses this year, from May 20th to August 11th, has reached almost 2,300. This surpasses last year's total for the same period, of around 2,100 cases. The total number of heat-related deaths reported this year stands at 21. The heat wave has also significantly affected livestock and fisheries. Between June 11th and August 12th, over 700,000 animals have died due to extreme temperatures. In the fisheries sector, nearly 900,000 fish have perished. In the coming days, most regions nationwide are expected to experience extreme heat, with field like temperatures of around 35 degrees Celsius. Tropical nights are also forecast for many areas of the country, particularly along the west coast. Meanwhile, experts say the country's electricity consumption is likely to increase, even more so due to increased demand in the semiconductor industry, as well as a greater need for air conditioning and EV charging. Ian Hee, Arirang News. Amid a recent resurgence in COVID-19, the health authorities plan to strengthen responses to curb the spread. According to an official from the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency on Tuesday, COVID-19 cases are expected to peak in late August as people return from vacations, increasing their contacts. The official added that inadequate ventilation due to air conditioning is a major factor behind the summer surge. In response, the agency has decided to expand its virus response team and buy more treatments this month to better control the outbreak. The government also plans to resume its vaccination campaign in October, with high-risk groups receiving vaccines for free. The South Korean government on Tuesday announced that it will advise electric vehicle manufacturers in the country to disclose information about their batteries. This decision was made at a vice ministerial meeting led by the Minister of the Office for Government Policy Coordination following an EV fire in Incheon that revealed a misreported battery source. In response, Hyundai, which holds over half of the domestic EV market, was first to disclose its battery suppliers for its 13 EV models, followed by Kia and Mercedes-Benz. The government also advises free inspections for all electric vehicles sold in the country. Over in the U.S., a new poll shows Vice President Kamala Harris leading over former President Donald Trump, quickly turning the tide with less than three months left until the election. Choi min reports. Three weeks into the U.S. presidential race, Democratic candidate and Vice President Kamala Harris is witnessing a quick turnaround in the polls. According to the national polling average kept by The Hill and Decision Desk HQ, Harris has taken the lead over her rival, former President Donald Trump. As of Monday, Harris led by 0.3 percentage points at 47.6 percent based on 111 different polls.
Although it's a narrow margin, it's the first time Harris has surpassed Trump in the national polling average. This is also a significant improvement from U.S. President Joe Biden's numbers. When Biden dropped out three weeks ago, Trump had a 2.3-point lead. Numbers also showed that Harris led Trump by 3.7 points when independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was included in the mix. Polls are moving in the vice president's favor in king swing states as well. A new poll from the New York Times and Siena College shows Harris taking the lead over Trump in three battleground states, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Republicans say Harris is still in a honeymoon period that will soon end and bring her polling back down. The Hill says an increase is often temporary and the upcoming debate between Harris and Trump could further shake up the race in unpredictable ways. Choi Min-dong, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, an Iranian attack against Israel may reportedly happen this week in retaliation for the assassination of a top Hamas figure in Tehran. Israel has raised its alert status to the maximum level and Western le leaders have issued a joint statement calling for Iran to stand down. Tai Yun-kyung has the latest. The White House says a potential Iranian attack on Israel could come anytime soon. The U.S. and Israel have analyzed that Iran is prepared to launch what could be a significant set of attacks within a few days. We share the same concerns and expectations that our Israeli counterparts have with respect to potential timing here. Could be this week. We're continuing to watch it very, very closely. Fox News, quoting regional sources, said Iran and its proxies could attack Israel within the next 24 hours in retaliation for the killing of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran late last month. Israeli military spokesperson Daniel Hagari says that Israel takes seriously the statements and remarks by its enemies, and therefore, Israel is at peak preparedness for attack and defense. Meanwhile, Hezbollah has recently fired rockets in northern Israel. The U.S. has sent a guided missile submarine to the Middle East as tensions grow in the region. Western leaders issued a joint statement on Monday local time calling for Iran to stand down. U.S. President Joe Biden and the leaders of France, Germany, Italy and the U.K. called on Iran to stand down its ongoing threats of a military attack against Israel and discuss the serious consequences for regional security should such an attack take place. Western leaders also endorsed a push for ceasefire and hostage deals in Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will travel to the Middle East this week as the United States seeks to propose a ceasefire and hostage release deal to bring an end to the war in Gaza. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Britain's Prime Minister Keir Starmer have also called on Iranian President Masoud Pezeshkian this week to exercise restraint and refrain from any actions that could lead to a wider conflict in the region. Cardinal Pietro Parolin, in a telephone conversation with Iranian President Masoud Pazeshkian, reportedly expressed deep concern over the conflict in the Middle East, reiterating the need to avoid the conflict and preferring every effort for dialogue, negotiation and peace. Cha yung -kyung, Arirang News. Elsewhere, Ukrainian ground forces continue to make significant advances into Russian territory. While Russia's Vladimir Putin vows to respond, Yi Singde covers this reality and its implications. On the seventh day of Ukraine's incursion into Russian territory, Kyiv's top military commander, General Alexander Suritsky, said Monday that his forces have now taken control of over 1,000 square kilometers of the Kursk region. That's an area one and a half times larger than South Korea's capital, Seoul. According to acting Kursk governor Alexei Smirnov, Ukraine has taken control of 28 villages. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky posted a video on social media platform X saying that he has ordered the military to establish a humanitarian plan within the operational area while seeking a strategy for returning prisoners of war. He is also seeking to obtain permission from the West to use long-range weapons. As Ukraine continues to push ahead in its offensive inside Russian territory, Russian President Vladimir Putin presided over an operational meeting on Monday. 
According to Russia's TASS News, the Russian leader instructed his forces to drive the Ukrainian military out of its territory and ensure stable border security. Putin also claimed that Kyiv launched attacks on the mainland to gain an advantage in future peace negotiations while destabilizing Russian society. He slammed Ukraine for its provocation that resulted in many casualties and vowed to respond appropriately. Concerns are also rising that the natural gas transport routes to Europe will be blocked due to the Ukrainian offensives in the border areas of Russia's mainland, where its natural gas facilities are located. Natural gas produced in Siberia is exported mainly to countries like Slovakia, Hungary and Austria through a pipeline located in the Kursk region. Last year, half of all Russian natural gas exports through Europe were supplied through this pipeline. Europe experienced a temporary energy crisis when the Nord Stream gas pipeline exploded in September 2022, allegedly due to sabotage. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. On the cultural front, Korea's webtoon industry is incorporating artificial intelligence as part of efforts to enhance the overall entertainment experience for its fans. Our Gunaryan shows us off. Since their emergence some two decades ago, South Korean webtoons have rapidly evolved over the years. As the name suggests, webtoons are digital comics that can be scrolled through in the palm of the reader's hand on a smartphone device. Easy accessibility and the wide scope of content have drawn in younger generations around the world. So I think that's definitely how um, webtoon has become so popular here in the West and how like people just started to become more open to um, different kinds of platforms and different kinds of storytelling. Now, South Korean webtoon companies have been tasked with integrating the latest technology boom into the scene for the tech-savvy audience, artificial intelligence. Naver's webtoon introduced a toon filter last year, turning user photos into webtoon-style art, generating over 90 million images globally. Recently, it added AI-driven features like character chat and webtoon caricature to its mobile app for even more personalized experiences. By integrating AI technology with IP, we hope that fans will be able to immerse themselves in webtoons beyond just reading that can become participants in the story. Character chat enables users to converse with their favorite webtoon characters through representative AI chatbots. And a month since its debut, more than a million users have accessed the service. Webtoon Caricature is an elevated version of the former Toon Filter service that kicked off in July. Anyone can become a Webtoon character with this latest AI service. Just snap a selfie and wait for the image to load. Currently, these services are provided only on the domestic platform, but Naver could be expanding to its global audience due to the popularity of its immersive AI services. Kakao Webtoon, on the other hand, is using AI algorithms through its Helix curation service to recommend users to other Webtoons after analyzing their purchase and reading history. But with the increasing usage of AI in the Webtoon industry, creators say that there is a need for more concrete guidelines and laws. If regulations and guidelines for generative AI are more firmly established as legal regulations, I think authors can use AI more actively and integrate it into their work. The use of generative AI is fast becoming a global issue across many media forms. How South Korean webtoons will continue to draw in readers and adapt to the changing AI landscape remains to be seen. Moon Hyeryeon, Arirang News. Korean actor Chaim Pyo's novel addressing the issue of comfort woman has been globally received, with the prestigious Oxford University having selected it as reading material. Tab recently talked to Arirang TV's program The Globalists about this novel, and we bring you a sneak peek. An actor and a writer whose writing is to be studied at one of most prestigious universities in the world. That is Chaim Pyo, whose novel, Once We Look at the Same Star, was selected as reading material for Korean studies classes from next semester at Oxford University. He was even invited as a guest speaker at the university's inaugural Korean Literature Festival on June 28. His inspiration to address the issue of comfort women came when he saw on TV a woman known as Grandma Hoon, 
coming back home from Cambodia in 1997. She was just 16 years old when taken from her hometown by the Japanese army and forced into sexual slavery, known euphemistically as comfort woman. Korea was liberated from Japanese colonial rule in 1945, but many comfort women, including Grandma Hoon, could not come back home out of shame. She lived half a century in the Cambodian jungle, until she came across a Korean traveler to whom she expressed her wish to go back home. Though she lost her language, her identity, she could sing the Korean folk song Arirang, and that moved his heart. My heart was aching because of the mixed feeling of, I would say, sadness, mm -hmm. anger, and disappointment, humiliation. When I thought of these comfort women, this word, what if, kept coming to my mind. What mm -hmm. if? What if these women were not taken away, had not been taken away, and somehow could have stayed home. Mm. Uh, these what-ifs were my questions, so I started you know, writing my novel. Filled with resentment, he started writing a novel. But such intense negative emotion could not sustain him, and when his laptop broke, he just gave up. Six years later, he started writing again, motivated not by political sentiment, but to let his children know the painful history of comfort women. He adds that when we fully empathize with the pain of one era, the next generation will not have to suffer the same pain. Whether you are Korean or Japanese or from any other country in the world, if we gather together and fully emphasize mm. the pain of comfort women mm -hmm. together, then I think the genuine apology, not the forced one, will emerge from there, as well as the true reconciliation for the next generation. The full episode of Taipei's in-depth story will be on air on The Globalist on Wednesday at 4.50 p.m. Korea time. The scorching heat of around 35 degrees Celsius rages on a day before Baibok, traditionally one of the last hot days of the year. There were showers here and there today. There were some showers today, but most will stop by tonight. Some southern parts of Gyeonggi-do province and northern areas of the Chungcheong-do provinces will continue to see rain until early tomorrow morning. Humidity levels have increased a lot due to the continuous showers. The scorching heat continues throughout the week. Heatwave warnings are still in place in most parts of the country, and Seoul will soar to 35 degrees tomorrow. In addition, UV rays will also be very strong during the daytime. Tomorrow's Seoul and Jeju will start off at 27 degrees. Daytime temperatures will move up to 34 in Daejeon and Gwangju, Daegu and Busan, 33 degrees. The scorching heat with tropical nights will continue until after National Liberation Day on Thursday. Please take care. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Arirang News will be back at 9 a.m. Korea time.